Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this contemporary military forum titled Revisiting the Readiness Balance. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broaden the knowledge base on Army professionals and those who support our Army. AUSA will amplify the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and help to further the Association's mission to, the, to be the voice for the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the, the Army story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, and the defense industrial base, and, the public, and to the public in communities around the world and across the country through AUSA's 122 chapters. If you are an AUSA member, thank you. And for those of you Army professionals that are not yet, we encourage you to join the AUSA membership by visiting the membership booth, booth 407 in Exhibit Hall A to sign up online or in person. On behalf of General Brown, AUSA's president and the rest of the AUSA team, here is a small token of appreciation for our panel's time and we appreciate for all of you being with us today. But before we start today's panel, I do have an admin note. Due to the current environment, we, had, we have had to reduce the capacity numbers in each room. Therefore, if you have to leave the room for some reason, please be advised that you may not be able to re-enter if others have done so in your absence. For now, though, I will turn it over to the moderator, Lieutenant General Richard Formica, U.S. Army, retired. Sir? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chief Wilson. And let me thank you for your service in our Army, for all that you continue to do to serve as the President of the Military Women's Memorial, and what you do here as a, at AUSA as a senior fellow. It's great to be back with an in-person event even with the challenges that we're encountering in a COVID environment. I'd like to add a special welcome to those of you who are joining by live stream. Thank you to AUSA for organizing this annual meeting. It should be a terrific three days of professional development, network, and collaborating. And a special thanks to AUSA for all that it does every day for our Army, our soldiers, our civilians, and their families. The topic of this panel is revisiting the readiness balance, and this conference provides a meaningful spotlight on that very important subject. To do so, AUSA has assembled a distinguished lineup whose vast experience and current responsibilities gives them unique and informed perspectives on readiness and how we'll revisit the readiness balance. We'll look forward to sharing those perspectives with you, and more importantly, hearing from you and getting questions from those of you that are here in the room. Our distinguished speaker and panel consists of General Mike Garrett, the Commanding General of the United States Army Forces Command, who will uh, give us opening comments in a few minutes. Our panel chair, Lieutenant General Jim Rainey, the Deputy Chief of Staff, G357, United States Army. Lieutenant General Eric Carrilla, Commanding General, 18th Airborne Corps. Major General Mike Keating, United Kingdom, Deputy Commanding General, 3rd Corps. And Dr. Chris Preble, the co-director of the New American Engagement Initiative, Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. The approach we'll take today, General Garrett will open our panel by making introductory remarks. He'll be followed by our panel chair and each of our three panel members. That should leave about an hour for your questions. And we'll finish up with each panel member having an opportunity to make some closing comments. At this time, I turn the floor over to our opening speaker, the Commanding General, United States Army Forces Command, General Mike Garrett. All right. All right, thanks. Thanks, everybody. And you know, I saw some of your eyes twinkle uh, when Chief gave you an out. She said, if you get out, you may not be able to come back in. 
So we're, we're watching you, right? Hey, listen, uh, good afternoon to everybody here and, and welcome. You know, to those of you who are here in this room with us, I know I am probably supposed to express my thanks to all of you for taking time to join us and have an important conversation about our Army's readiness. And I certainly do appreciate your time. But more importantly, I'll ask you to please carry my sincere thanks back to your fellow soldiers and teammates who made it possible for you to attend this conference. It is my privilege to be here among so many experts, friends, dedicated public servants, but the only reason I am here is because of the soldiers, civilians, contractors across U.S. Army Forces Command are hard at work building readiness and taking care of our people. I know that you are making every effort to represent your teammates at AUSA and will do your best to bring value and new perspectives back to your teammates. And to those of you tuning in, over the internet, thank you for your focus and for sharing these conversations with our teammates and colleagues. As much as I wish you could be here with us in person, I am confident that you'll still benefit from listening to this panel's experts. I am honored to help usher in this afternoon's topic or discussion about a topic military commanders have like, likely struggled with since one of the Earth's first recorded wars. Back in 1497, and I'm sure there are some history buffs out there, if you know the battle, raise your hand. I'm not gonna tell you then. <laughs> 3,500 years later, 3,500 years later, people are still fighting wars, recovering from war, and preparing for the next war all in the defense of their nations and their people. And leaders like us have always asked some of the same questions. What might the next war look like? How prepared do we need to be for it? How prepared can we afford to be? And how do we sustain that preparedness over the long term? Near the end of his career, General Norman Schwarzkopf said, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. I have a deep respect and admiration for General Schwarzkopf. When I was a brand new second lieutenant, he was my commanding general in the 24th Infantry Division. And at that same time, my dad, Command Sergeant Major Ed Garrett, served as his division Command Sergeant Major. And I'll tell you, my soldiers and I absolutely sweated in peace. We trained hard. It felt good to dominate an objective during situational training exercise lanes and live fires. It felt good to have equipment that were well maintained and did what we needed the equipment to do. And it felt great to trust the skills and resolve of my fellow soldiers. As the Commanding General of the United States Army Forces Command, the absolute best part of my job, believe it or not, it's not getting dressed up and speaking in convention halls. It's the time that I spend visiting our soldiers in the field, their motor pools, and the combat training centers, and watching this generation of soldiers dominate objectives, take pride in their equipment, and pursue excellence as teams. The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. I don't think it's news to any of you that more than any time in the past 20 years, our Army is at peace. It's time for us to start sweating more because we don't know when or, war or where the next war will happen, but when it does, I don't want to see soldiers bleed. Whenever and wherever this war happens, it's going to be more violent, more connected, more complicated than any war in the last 3,500 years. 
This army, hopefully alongside our allies and the many friends who share our national interests, we have got to be ready. And that is why this panel is about revisiting the readiness balance. I'll take just a moment to dissect this title and set the stage for the coming conversation. This is about revisiting because our requirements are not a static mark on the wall. Our priorities are dynamic as our world, American culture, and our adversaries' calculations change. You and I cannot afford to be reactionary. So today's discussion seeks to revisit what the nation needs from its army. This is also about readiness, which is the reason we exist. If America's army is not ready to fight and win the nation's wars, then it might not, then it might as well not have an army at all. I sleep well each and every night because I know our army is ready for the next fight. And with leaders like Eric Carrilla, Tony Agudo, John Koloszewski, Xavier Brunson, Pat White, Jody Daniels, John Jensen, and their colleagues, I know readiness will remain clearly in focus. And finally, we will talk about balance. Balance between our priorities of people, readiness, and modernization, and how we ensure that the Army and our partners have sufficient readiness to fight tonight and to stay on track with our long-term efforts. If you're a commander at any level, you achieve balance by understanding your changing requirements and conditions and making micro and macro adjustments to tailor your readiness, your plans, and your priorities. In 2021, no fighting force can afford to build readiness that they do not require. Yes, the U.S. Army must achieve overmatch so that we win decisively. But anything more than that, and you can call it whatever you want, would simply be irresponsible because we would sacrifice the opportunity to invest in our people and modernization. And so we need leaders like you to weigh and revisit your unit's readiness balance with purpose and with clarity. The leaders joining us on this panel are the right people to share insights on the readiness balance. I trust their perspectives, and I think we have a lot to gain from this discussion. Furthermore, I think they and all of us have a lot to gain from the thoughts you all choose to share with this group. And I'll thank you in advance for asking some bold and challenging questions. As I said before, the most important thing you will do is bring these thoughts back to your own teams and debate them there. And I imagine your fellow soldiers will share many more bold and challenging worthwhile ideas. So thanks again for joining us to sweat more in peace so we, le we bleed less in war. And now I'll hand the mic over to our panel moderator, and we'll listen to uh, our very, very talented panel members. Thank you. Thank you, General Garrett. And with that, Lieutenant General Rainey. General Garrett, General Formica, teammates, thank you all very much for the opportunity. So I'm uh, Jim Rainey, I'm the G357 for the Army. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about readiness from kind of the big Army perspective. Uh, first, uh, just looking around out here, I mean, uh, the, the best trainers, leaders, and warfighters I know, past, present, and future commander, command sergeant major sitting out here in the room. So uh, I, I, I hope that I can provide some comments that stimulate a good professional discussion, vice telling you anything that uh, you distinguished warfighters don't already know. So let me start with uh, rearm, <clears throat> regionally aligned readiness modernization model. So what's new? So we like to roll out new stuff at AUSA, new kit. This is a new big idea. It's a unit life cycle model. Some of you might be familiar, US Army, uh, 
<clears throat> R4Gen, strategic readiness, we've had different models. So rearm is our new model, one October, initial operating capability. So in FY22, we're gonna learn, we're gonna implement and learn. And we will do some learning because there's some learning to be done still. But it's very important. And the idea to General Garrett's point about balance is we need to generate readiness through a training cycle, provide war winning readiness, war winning units to our combatant commanders. The things that some of General Corilla's soldiers and teammates were able to do on HKI, for example, that doesn't happen by accident. We've got soldiers all over the world, 139 countries in support of our great combatant commanders. So we gotta train, generate that readiness, consume it in a meaningful way on operations. And we also need to build dedicated time to modernize. The Army's under a major modernization effort, most significant, conservatively most significant in 40 years that we're on the verge of undertaking. So we're gonna have to build dedicated time. Units being asked to go to the field, send some soldiers somewhere, and oh, by the way, uh, you got some new kit coming in, send some folks down to the motor pool. They'll probably ask you when they get to divest the stuff they got. That's not on the th training schedule, right? So a so lot of churn over 20 years, we're gonna settle into a new model that is all about predictability. Some people will talk about reducing op tempo. Um, I'm in favor of that. Good effort. If anybody figures out how to do it, I'm, I'm, I'd appreciate a call being the G3. <laughs> That'd be interesting to me. Uh, I, I, you know, I've been in the Army a little while. General Carrillo and I were second lieutenants together, and, and I don't ever remember then or any time since sitting around going, wish I had some more stuff to do. <laughs> so op tempo is kind of a thing in the Army. But what we can do as leaders and, and what I would offer is a huge opportunity to take better care of the men and women in our families is increase predictability. I, I think soldiers like, I mean, they join the Army to do things. They like going to the field. Uh, they like training hard. I, I think they like deploying. What they don't like is unpredictability, right? They don't like showing up to work on Monday and finding out they're going to the field or telling their spouse they'll be at a game and then they're not, right? So this is a huge opportunity to increase predictability, <clears throat> which should increase the time that our leaders can spend with the lead, leader to lead ratio, which is I would offer the number one thing we can do to get at some of the problems we're having taking care of people in the Army. <clears throat> so rearm, synchronize current readiness and future readiness, drive up predictability, provide dedicated time to do the modernization we have to do, but to General Garrett's comments, it's all about generating war-winning readiness, right? If we can't, that's why we exist as an army, to deploy, deter the enemy. If they wanna fight, we gotta be able to fight and win with our partners <clears throat> and with our allies. So that's rearm, and I can talk more about that if anybody's interested. Uh, gonna, gonna figure it out in 22, we'll hit full stride in 23. It's total army. It's gonna look different in a compo one unit. We're gonna move through eight or nine month cycles probably. Uh, but our great compo two and compo three teammates are gonna go through it too on their dedicated cycles. It looks a little different if you're forward deployed already, right? So, so there are great teammates serving in Europe and two CR can't, can't tell the Russians they need eight months off to modernize, right? So it's gonna look a little different. Look a little different in Alaska and the Pacific. Total army implement in 22, be up and running by 23. <clears throat> so kind of begs the question, uh, another thing I'd like to share with you is ready for what? You know, I get that a lot. What are we, what are we trying to be ready for? I think that's a reasonable question you should be able to answer for your subordinates or we should as leaders. So here's, here's some thoughts. One, we gotta be ready to go out and compete, right? We gotta compete, we got some serious peer competitors, we got a lot of lesser included problems in the Army, and I think, or in the, as a country, and I think what we wanna do as an Army is provide formations, forces, leaders, and soldiers that can compete. Posture, deter by the enemy believing that they'll lose a fight if they start it, be in the right place, be agile. So we gotta compete, campaign effectively, because that's the key to preventing a war that we don't want to fight, 
right? Not because we're worried about losing, but because nobody was going to win a great power fight these days, right? So we got to be ready to go out and campaign and compete effectively to prevent a war. Now, we all know that's not going to happen. So the next thing is, if there's a crisis that arises, um, <clears throat> think January, New Year's Eve timeframe last year. <clears throat> if there's a crisis, we need to be ready to respond to that in a way that returns that crisis back into competition as opposed to accelerating that, comp that crisis into the conflict. And the third thing we need to be ready for is what I've been talking about. We've got to be ready to fight and win. The enemy has to believe that we have the will and the skill and the teamwork to win a war with our partners and allies if they choose to fight. And it's kind of a paradox or a circle because you can't compete effectively unless the enemy believes that you can win a war if they want to have one. So that's it. Be ready to compete, respond to crisis, to return it to competition, and if we have to, to win a conflict. And the last thing I'd say, um, another thing about readiness term kind of gets grouped into one lump sum, like we need to be ready. And I would offer there's a whole another level of fidelity when you think about it, <clears throat> because it's different. You want to have, what, is it, what does it mean to be a unit? What does it mean to be a ready unit? What does, it need, what does it mean for your soldiers to be ready? What does it mean for your families to be ready? So family readiness matters. And most importantly, or the biggest challenge I'd offer everybody that I, I personally spend a lot of time thinking about is what does it mean to have our leaders ready? What does leader readiness be, mean? Because that's, that's gonna be the thing in all this chaos confusion, the future of war, the challenges while you're back home in garrison, starting with leader readiness, I would offer is probably the most significant thing we can focus on as leaders. So that's uh, what I thought I'd start out with. I'll turn it over. I just found out I was the chair. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not, I'm not that, to that means you can do whatever you want. All right. All right. But thank you all very much. Hey, thanks, Jim. Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Really looking forward to today's discussion. Today I'm going to talk about being ready for the next fight. And so today I'll talk about preparing for large-scale combat, combat operations, or LESCO, uh, and what we're doing in 18th Airborne Corps through the introduction of artificial intelligence into the Corps. So our number one priority in 18th Airborne Corps is readiness for LESCO, and I firmly believe that a failure to embrace and incorporate artificial intelligence into our education, training, targeting and decision making is at our own peril in the next fight. Uh, one way we're operationalizing artificial intelligence is through a quarterly exercise we call Scarlet Dragon. Um, the Scarlet Dragon series is designed to increase our joint warfighting capability by using AI augmented decision making to significantly increase the scale, speed, and accuracy of our targeting process. And we run these exercises quarterly and they're exercises, not experiments. So all six services participate in a community of interest with each service working unique mission essential task lists or directed learning objectives that fit into the larger exercise. We just finished our fourth iteration of this last week. We had over 40 aircraft from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, 11 unique satellites, patrol vessels from the Coast Guard, maritime operations centers from the Navy, HIMARS from the Marines and Army, attacking the Mid-Atlantic Electronic Warfare Range that runs from Southern Virginia down through the Carolinas, and it's a series of ranges and emitters that we then extend into Fort Bragg and Fort Stewart and use work with the FAA to get those air ranges to go into that. And we've been able to drop two live GBU 32,000 pound bombs for the first time ever on Fort Bragg on an artificially intelligence derived 10 digit grid that was two feet off the surveyed grid um, the last time we executed that. It's helped us to make AI augmented decisions at the speed and scale required in LESCO, and I'm happy to talk about the metrics that we use uh, for that in the Q&A. And so as the range and lethality of our adversaries' weapons increase, so too does the core battle space. It goes well beyond now the doctrinal 100 kilometer by 60 kilometer core space, particularly in the deep fight as we see that going up exponentially. And for us, this is about using today's tech to increase our warfighting capability with our joint partners about seeing ways to achieve decision dominance in LESCO and about continuing to grow the culture of innovation and learning of, as an organization how to employ data as a strategic asset. Next slide, please. 
So AI is not something you can just sprinkle into your formations. You have to have a culture that embraces it, a workforce that is data literate, policies and governance that enable the AI, and the infrastructure, particularly operating in the cloud to include edge computing that enables the AI. And we have an effort we call Project Ridgeway that addresses this, and we'll be happy to discuss details of that during the Q&A or any other topics you want to discuss. Thank you. I told good. you it'd only be about two minutes. <laughs> you, you did good, thanks. Uh, Major General Mike Keating. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to begin with a word of thanks to General Garrett for inviting me onto this prestigious panel today. I'm privileged to be here with Lieutenant Generals Rainey and Carilla and Mr. Preble, all three of whom have outstanding professional reputations. It's an honor to be with you all today. To address what revisiting the readiness balance means for Third Armored Corps, I'll first set the context for where we find ourselves as a headquarters before then focusing on two critical levers of readiness success. I'll conclude with some reflections on our training engine that is the ultimate insurance mechanism of our ready forces today. And as the only alien on this panel, I'll add some <laughs> thoughts on the importance of interoperability because nobody should ever have to fight alone. So context. Following well-documented changes to operational design across the Middle East, our headquarters is now focused on the task of meeting the US Army's strategic goals of transforming to an MDO force by 2028 and full synchronization with the Joint Force on warfighting capabilities by 2035, aligning with the rearm process to generate competitive combat power capable of winning tonight's fight while modernizing for persist persistent competition and large-scale combat operations in the future. As with everything the US Army does, our work gathers momentum at an extraordinary pace. And as our recent success on Warfighter goes to prove, we've plenty to be proud of in terms of the competence of our people and the effectiveness of our capabilities. But there's still much to learn and we must continue to adapt accordingly. In addition to the 13,000 troops three Corps has deployed across 20 different countries, supporting six separate combatant commands today, Three Corps is America's hammer, the finishing force for any large-scale enduring conflict. We are the Global Penetration Corps, using every means at our disposal across the Joint Force to penetrate into the enemy's rear, which is, as General Patton once described it, the happy hunting ground for armor. We're conditioned to relentlessly exploit and pursue until we bring our adversary to a decisive finish. And to achieve this, we have a potent array of tools at hand. Some 40% of the US Army's combined arms combat power, structured within four divisions with over a dozen enabling formations spread across seven installations in six different states. As impressive as that might sound, none of this is said with any hubris, for there are two truths to acknowledge, which if taken for granted, would reduce three corps to nothing other than an inefficient consumer of resource. These truths are our people culture and the discipline with which we exercise our maintenance and supply processes. It is these two elements of the readiness conundrum which bring balance and poise to our core and which underpin our readiness for competition and conflict. First then, our people. At its worst, three core consists of over 90,000 individuals whose only common characteristic is the uniform they wear. At its best, Three Corps' success is achieved through the selfless commitment of fit, disciplined teams that are led by world-class leaders. We would be nothing were it not for these leaders who exude the Army's values in everything they do, and for our soldiers who commit to being a part of something greater than themselves. That's teamwork, that's the creation of a sense of belonging, and that's what ready people are all about. And we must manage this talent carefully too. Wary as we are of our, of our adversary's competitive ambitions, so must we ensure that the competitiveness of the domestic employment market does not drain the pond from which we fish for talent. We must retain our people and unlock their true potential on behalf of this great nation. That's why we've launched Operation People First, to tackle the harmful behaviors of sexual assault, sexual harassment, extremism, and suicide. 
For three core, there is no confusion over what people first means, nor its relationship with readiness. It's always been about people, for they are the lethal edge of all that we do, and without them, we would be nothing. So rebalancing readiness at three core is as much about people as anything. Large-scale combat operations that, that, that necessitate the deployment of three core's armored capability will be a marathon, the outcome of which will depend on the resilience of our people and their disciplined execution of maintenance and supply activities, which is a second driver of, re of rebalancing readiness that I'd like to address. One of our greatest strengths is the mobility afforded to us by our vast array of armored platforms. Three core goes where our platforms take us, and without serviceable vehicles and a robust supply chain in support, we won't go very far. The efficacy of our maintenance culture begins at home station, where the CG's expectation is that our squad and platoon leaders will spend 80% of their in barracks times in the motor pools. We haven't abrogated responsibility from the chain of command, though. Leaders at every level are routinely held to account for their equipment status and their divestment plans. Our process for improving the operational readiness of our vehicle fleets continues to evolve. How we see ourselves and the objectivity attached to that critical self-analysis is crucial to, to our ability to achieve balanced readiness. This is a data-rich field which we strive to exploit in the most effective and efficient manner possible. Supply discipline is equally important. The metrics of a healthy supply system are clear, and we have very high standards against which to measure our performance. The critical importance of supply specialists who demand, account for, and track our supply support activity cannot be underestimated. I'm firmly of the opinion that the supply environment is where we could most usefully seize the advantage through the introduction of artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics. And I'm excited about the work that's being coordinated in concert with Army Futures Command and Army Materiel Command. It would be remiss of me not to highlight the importance of our organic industrial base. Similarly, the value of a secure strategic homeland from which to project and sustain ourselves is equally important to any discussion of supply chain integrity and resilience. I've done neither of those issues the service they deserve with these few words, but it's important that I capture them nonetheless. Let me draw things to a close by reflecting on our training engine, which affords, which affords us the space to experiment, to fail, and to get better while we can. Our collective training centers are world-class facilities that push our people and our systems to their physical limits. They objectively validate our ready forces and allow us to see both strengths and weakness. But exposure to CTC is a rare opportunity for most of our leaders, a once in a lifetime experience for many. So we must be ready to train with the right people, the right doctrine, the right maintenance, and the right teams at every opportunity. Three core sweats a minimum of six formations through NTC every year. We are the majority user of this outstanding facility. So for us, being ready for NTC is just like being ready for war. Time is now against me, but for the record, none of what we do by way of building and balancing readiness can be constructed in isolation. That's in part why you have a Brit as a DCG of this fine core. And we, like many of your allies and partners, are littered throughout the US Army's architecture. We're the physical manifestation of human interoperability, the lowest and arguably easiest form of mutual understanding and the very basis upon which trust is articulated and built. But even for me, converting one 10 volt to two 20 volt electricity isn't an easy task. <laughs> it takes commitment and patience on both sides and it takes an extraordinary amount of trust. The UK, like many of your allies and partners, shares a bond of common trust and values that continues to stand the test of time, resilient as we all are to external pressures. I'm honored to call myself a phantom warrior, and I take great pride in caring for US soldiers in the same way I would care for my own. Alliances, partnerships, and coalitions are a defining characteristic of our winning edge in today's competitive world and the envy of many an adversary. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of that war-winning reality. Thank you, General Keating. And now, Dr. Preble. 
Well, thank you very much, and thanks especially to the organizers for the invitation to be here on this panel. It's, a, it's really a great honor to be here. Um, I am not like the other people on this panel, uh, if you hadn't guessed. Uh, I had to ask some awkward questions about even what the different insignia were, so I've been learning a lot today. Uh, my job on this panel is to be the, uh, General, General Formica called me the stray volt. Uh, I like that. I think I'm going to use that again. <laughs> Uh, my purpose today is to spell out what I think is, is the inherent tension between the Army's several key priorities and to urge all of you to be explicit about the trade-offs that you are making every day and think carefully about the assumptions that guide those trade-offs. Ask your, and I'm in the assumptions testing business. That's what my, my job is at the Atlantic Council. And so ask yourself, what would have to change for me to reassess my priorities? If I believe something to be true and then I discover that it's not, what would I do differently? We have to force ourselves to think this way because as human beings, we don't like to choose. We like to believe that all good things go together as part of Preparing for this panel, I forced myself to do research, which in 2021 means going to Google, and finding an ad that I recalled from my youth. Um, a horrible ad campaign from the mid-1980s, which I discovered was for Michelob Light. Ugh. Just, ugh. Anyway, the ads asked, who says you can't have it all? And the punchline of the ad was, you can have it all. Nickelodeon Light, I guess. No, you can't. Any functioning organization has to set priorities, and the dysfunctional ones have the priorities set for them. So I urge you all to be thoughtful and deliberate. The overriding objective, as we've heard over and over again today, the overriding objective for the Army is to fight and win the nation's wars. But we also know that the, the Army is expected to do a lot of other things. And even if we agree that the clear number one priority for the Army, it, it dwarfs all of those other things, fighting and winning the nation's wars, dwarfs all of those other things, that still doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Ready to fight when? Tomorrow, in six months, in two years? And ready to fight which wars? Where? Does that matter? I think it does. I think it does. But that's a point for discussion, debate. And of course, it boils down to three things that you've heard many times. Force structure, how big, readiness, how ready, modernization over what period of time. A force that's too big but unready is a hollow force. A force that focuses on the near term at the expense of investments in the future capabilities might be ready to fight now or in the next few years, but not five or ten years from now. This is all pretty elementary, I'm sure. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But consider another set of assumptions around time. Should we assume that the Army and the nation, I'm going to come back to that, will have time to prepare for future wars? Or is time not on our side, generally speaking? Is time not on our side? Believing that we have time to adjust can lead to complacency. Back in the 1990s, the Army was engaged in a range of operations, relatively small-scale op missions in far-flung places. And when the missions involved fighting against bad guys, it looked like war. We called it a war. But there was a bad acronym for everything else, military operations other than war, MUTWA. And the assumption herein was that if the Army was ready to fight the wars, then it'd be ready or could quickly become ready for those lesser things, lesser things, in quotes. So fast forward to where we are today, because I'm just not so sure that the assumptions that ready to fight and win means we will be equally ready to fight to do everything else. It could be, and just in the spirit of being the stray bolt, it could be that the other things that the Army is called upon to do every day are more specialized than war fighting. It's possible that the years-long campaigns of the recent past in Iraq and Afghanistan won't look like anything at all like the wars of the future. 
It's even possible that the smaller scale but persistent counterterrorism operations in the greater Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera, it's possible those will fade in importance. Some say no, some say yes, we'll see. But that all may seem obvious to you and to the Army. But I'm also here to represent humbly those of us who are not in the Army. Because I think it's possible that there are other instruments of statecraft, those capabilities that allow the U.S. government to keep the people of this country safe and prosperous and free, don't have much to do with war fighting at all. If that's correct, or if it's even possible, what would a different organization with a different set of skills and a different focus, what would its leaders look like? What would its personnel look like? How would it operate? Does the Army think it should have that mission too, beyond war fighting? I don't know. Because here's where things get really complicated for the Army, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Remember when I said at the outset that highly effective organizations set their own priorities and dysfunctional ones have their priorities set for them? Well, that's not fair. Because some organizations have their priorities set for them, and it isn't their fault. And I think one of those organizations may be the United States Army. Because answering the question about what capabilities other than warfighting will be required to keep this country safe, that isn't a decision that the Army can make or I think should make. Racking and stacking national priorities, that is what the United States' overarching national security strategy should be, that necessarily includes other components other than the military. But there has been this tendency, we all know it, in this country, to lean on the military, not just the Army, to do things that other parts of the U.S. government or U.S. society, including the private sector, frankly, should do. And I think that's created a host of problems, both for the Army and for the nation it serves. So I leave you with this. I don't ask my physician to change the tires on my car, and I don't ask my auto mechanic to do my taxes. General Rainey has already told me that he's going to steal that, for, for, and, and it's, it's all his. And General Garrett, in his opening remarks, said, asked what, he, for, I urged all of you to think, what the nation needs from its army. And I'm here to say that you all might ask what the army needs from the nation. So as you all comprising this great institution, and again, thank you for letting me join you for a few hours, as you think about what you want this organization to do, the United States Army, what it needs to do, I urge you to be equally clear about what it shouldn't do and can't do, and be explicit in marking out those red lines. This is not a violation of all of your admirable can-do spirit. It's a reflection of sound strategic thinking that takes account of core competencies and resource constraints. Remember, an organization that claims it can have it all really can't. An organization that professes to be ready for everything really isn't. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you very much to our panel. Now, uh, they graciously gave their time over to you so this is your opportunity to ask questions of the panel. Please feel free to come and uh, take advantage of the microphones, introduce yourself, and we're looking forward to your questions. We've got plenty of time, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Who's going to be first? There we go. Hi, I'm Megan Myers from Military Times. Um, so I wanted to talk about rearm and how that squares with uh, Secretary Austin's recent memo about trying to get to a three to one dwell to deployment ratio throughout the military. So with that 24 month cycle, how does that fit with this goal to give everybody three years at home for every one year away? And how realistic is that for the Army given what you guys have on your plate? I'll take a shot at that. Um, First of all, everybody aspires to, to get to that deploy to dwell ratio that the Secretary has set. Um, it's actually been aspirational for a while, and uh, 
our current secretary has set it as a standard, so versa goal. Um, so I, I believe, given what's going on in the Army right now in the world, that we will be able to do that. We have some high demand, uh, low density formations. Our, our air defense forces specifically come to mind and a few others mm -hmm. where that's going to be challenging. But I, I believe that rearm will help us with the predictability that we need to do that. And General Corolla, since you're a little closer to that situation, being commanding a corps, do you have any thoughts about your units and whether they can make that goal? I think it all comes down to the contingencies that we have to respond to. So if you look at the most recent one, I mean, that is we, we rotate those units through an operational readiness cycle. And candidly, for the first time, we've been able to get the 82nd Airborne Division on an actual operational readiness cycle because we have all three of their uh, BCTs are back and it was kind of like when Jim and I were lieutenants um, back in the day you had a very deliberate process by which to go through uh, very similar to rearm um, but now with rearm taking on the modernization aspect of that as well so I think we can a lot of it's going to depend on the combatant command demand signal of those deployed units and that is that is one of the baseline things that drives everything so what does it look like for each of those combatant commands where we're going to put forces and then from that then we determine the uh, um, that, that dwell time. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Anybody else? Please. If you guys want to start thinking about your questions and line yourselves up, we've got four mics, and you can post yourselves, and we'll uh, call on you as, in sequence. Hey, sir. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking my question. Uh, comes to, my question uh, revolves around uh, intellectual readiness. Uh, and PME and JPME. And what role do you think the future of PME and JPME is going to play uh, for the force to be intellectually ready for competition, uh, crisis, and uh, conflict? Thank you. Anybody want to take that on? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you go. I'll take a shot at it, too. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. That's a great, great question. Um, and I, I talked about, I would put that in the category of leader readiness. And, and I'm personally of the opinion that, that you know, leadership's the most decisive element of combat power, and it's an answer to almost every problem we have on or off the battlefield. So it's absolutely essential that we think about PME. Now, in the United States Army, uh, we have a proud tradition of, of doing professional military education very well. We, we resource it. The amount of time our officers, non-commissioned officers, spend in uh, professional military education settings is more than anybody in any army or service that I'm aware of. But we can't rest on our laurels. So I, I, I do think we got to think about some PME reform in, in two two main ways. Is one uh, a re so the national defense strategy is going to come out, national security strategy. Um, we've received guidance to increase the emphasis on China in our PME, and that, that's uh, the first thing we have to do. Um, and I think we need to think about skills we don't possess now that we're going to need, that we're certain or believe we're going to need in the future, and make sure that our education develops skills. Um, the future of com combat is going to be different. It's going to be faster. It's going to be more lethal. Um, and I think developing leaders that can operate in that context with that level of uncertainty and get it oriented against our peers, or, or the, the correct uh, peer adversary. One of the things I, I was taught early probably by somebody in this room is uh, you train for the known and you educate for the unknown, right? So if it's something you know you're going to have to do on the battlefield, you can train for that. I think, given the complexity and uncertainty going forth, that uh, making sure we're developing leaders and units that can handle the unknown is going to be absolutely essential. And I, I, I couldn't, uh, could not put enough emphasis on the importance of PME. Thank you for that question. Good, thanks. John Cole, did you want to take a start? I think Jim nailed it. Anybody else? Yeah, just John um, Keating? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, uh, great question. Uh, I'm just looking back at my script, and, it, and it's something I just didn't have the time to talk about. But I, but I, I tried to emphasize the need to rebuild the academic foundations from the strategic to the tactical. It's, a, it's the cornerstone 
for me, of people readiness, resilient minds, and so on and so forth. I'd also just reflect, of course, that wars are won or lost in the minds of people. And I think that begins as much with the people that are the war fighters as it is the public that are you know, suffering the trials and tribulations of warfare as well. So I think it's a great question. Uh, I think it's fundamental to success going forwards. One of the things I'll say real quick, if I could, is where we see a gap right now um, as we start working some of the artificial is data literacy. And our biggest gatekeepers, the, the people that are preventing us, is a lot of our uh, majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels because they, they're the ones that keep Jim's favorites on their, on their desktop. They don't understand cloud computing. They don't understand data literacy. So one of the things we're doing to get after that is an education process throughout the core. Um, right now we have partnerships with our uh, education our, um, universities. I think we're 21 universities. That includes all 17 in uh, um, North Carolina, but each one of the divisions is partnered with it, whether it's Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, we're working Syracuse with 10th Mountain. Um, and so we do these partnerships and we also have several courses that they then, we get our, our kind of our mid-level managers, if you will, uh, to become data literate and understand the technology so they can look at data as a strategic asset going forward. That's a very niche portion of that, that PME, I think, and it has to be taught in our PME. Okay, next question. While, while they're thinking about their question, General Curl, at one point you had talked about uh, AI uh, and in, embedding it in training, education, targeting, and decision making to kind of pull the thread from this last set of questions. How do you see training and education evolving as we introduce new technologies. So, I, I mean, I think I'd go right back to the comment I made there where we're trying to educate and make a data literate workforce uh, going forward. But you really have to create a culture of innovation internal to your organization. As you all know, culture takes years to develop. So how do you create this culture in an organization where people feel that they can challenge assumptions on a regular basis, that they can bring up ideas um, to do that. So we have several programs in the core that we try and elevate ideas and show that it could be a private in an organization. We have one of the, uh, we have a truck driver right now who is working on his PhD in computer science, but because he came from Ghana, he couldn't get a clearance initially, so he became a truck driver, and he's now one of our primary coders that is working a lot of our, uh, our tech for us currently within the core. Um, and so how do you identify that talent and then elevate those ideas going forward? Okay, great, thanks. There are four microphones and they're all empty. <laughs> I encourage you, I mean, we got a pretty a potent panel here talking about one of the most important subjects facing our Army today. I would encourage your question. Sir. Uh, Gil Sanborn, I'm a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army and I want to thank you all for, for this incredible panel. Uh, a couple of you have talked about the Army's mission, which is to win America's wars. Uh, your civilian panelists talked about making sure we don't, the, the things that we don't get involved in. But when you look at our history here over the last 70 years, the last time we declared victory was 1945, and we haven't declared war in a long time. When I look at the missions of the other branches, they've become very nuanced over the last 15 years. And so my, my basic question is, is the, the mission Win America's Wars suitable to the diversity of the kinds of threats and the kinds of applications that we have today that really don't fit into that very simple term? I'll, I'll, I'll start this. Um, thank you, sir, for your question. Um, I do think that on the one hand, as a, as a society, we have lost track of this distinction between warfare and peacetime, which is part of what you question. And in this, I've been heavily influenced by a really terrific book by uh, Rosa Brooks on, on this very question, right? Once upon a time as a society, any society, it knew when it was at peace, it knew when it was at war. And if what we've experienced over the last 15 or 20 years is um, you know, the nation at peace, the Army and the other military branches at war, that doesn't really solve the problem. That's act that is the problem, right? That we're not differentiating very well as a society. So I think now is time for us to have a conversation about that, right? This is a reset of sorts. 
as we prepare for these very different fights of the future. Personally, I think that the, the declare war clause of the Constitution, Madison said it was the most important of the entire document. I think the man was right. And I think that as a society, we should not undertake war in a cavalier fashion or fall into it, as I think sometimes we have recently. Um, it doesn't answer a very sort of more, more specific question, which I'd love to hear from the other panelists, um, but, but I am troubled by this, if that's your question. One other thing, by the way, I, I scribbled a note to myself. This may be relevant or not. We assume, I think, that the war is over there, right? We have assumed that as a society. Um, again, for all of you who've been fighting these wars, um, you haven't been fighting them here. That's why, you know, training center is sort of like now the, the new, right, back the way it used to be. I don't know that the war of the future is, is going to be over there. I think we need to assume that the homeland is not a sanctuary. And that's a hard conversation. And again, not one for this organization. It's for the society outside of this conference center. And I think we need to have a serious, a, a serious discussion about that. <clears throat> Any other panel members? Uh, while, while you're thinking, I, I would just say this also begs the question of the discussion. Um, Dr. Preble was talking and he commented on um, back not too long ago when we had Mutua, right? And there has long been this debate on whether or not if we train our army to fight and win our nation's wars, that will it, it will inherently be capable of doing these lesser included tasks. Dr. Preble raised the question about some of these niche and unique requirements that may be expected of us. The G3 referred to them as some of the requirements in competition. And I think it's an important discussion as to where do we come down on this notion of if we're trained and ready for to win and fight our nation's wars, are we inherently ready to do these others? Or are there niche capabilities and niche requirements that are expected of us? And how do we organize and train for those? I put that to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, take that. So, right. what, one point of clarity that might be useful is um, it's not that if you're trained to fight large scale combat ops against a tough enemy that you can inherently do lesser included. I think that, to, in fairness to some of the great leaders that kind of took us down that path 20, 25 years ago. It's you. You will ha if you have to do a lesser included. It will not be an existential threat to your sovereignty, and therefore you'll have the time to make the adjustments you need to make. Whereas the inverse is not true, especially today. As good you know, as good as the peers that we're going to fight are, that if if you're going to focus on something, it better be to be able to beat a good enemy when it's an existential threat to your way of life as a democracy. Um, so I would just offer that as a clarity. Whether that bore out and how well that bore out is, you know, that's probably a different different seminar. But uh, if you have to pick, we better be able to win a fight against a good enemy. Anybody else? Okay, any other questions from the audience? Hi there, Paul Norwood. Uh, General Rainey, you had talked about what, is, uh, what does readiness mean at the tactical level or at the soldier level? Just on that thought, uh, how will the Army help tactical leaders with soldier readiness? And is there, is there a role for data and analytics at the, at the junior level so that we can enable them to make sure that they have the right knowledge and understanding about, uh, about their families and their soldiers? He said Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely do think there's a there's a requirement for that down at the uh, the squad level. I mean, I, the the soldiers we're getting in right now, I, I think, have a lot of that acumen. Yeah. Um, and when, one of the things that the Star Major of the Army is working right now is how do they look at the readiness of a squad uh, in terms of the analytics behind it? 
if you go back to what the old way we used to do our USR on a squad, it was, are they properly manned and are they qualified on their weapon? Um, where I, I'm not sure that's the right metric to use to determine the readiness of that tactical squad. So there's a bunch of different metrics that they're looking at and they're currently piloting a program um, right now to be able to take a look at that. And then, sir, have you seen anything about the trust in the data at that level? I know one of the issues we used to have in the day was, hey, I got an enterprise level uh, data set that was enabling or trying to enable a brigade level operation or activity. And do the junior leaders trust that data? I think the trust comes also with the education on understanding the lineage of that data. Where did it come from? So the more we educate the force on understanding how the data is derived, the more trust that you're going to have in that. I think the other, thank you. Anybody else on that yeah, subject? I've just got yeah, please. something to say. Um, you know, five, five months in the court, I think this is absolutely what the Army is spending a huge amount of time uh, and resource attending to, is getting to know its soldiers um, and rekindling that relationship between leaders and soldiers uh, as well. So, you know, coming to Fort Hood, my, from my perspective, the, the resources that are available to, to understand soldiers, to help soldiers, is incredible. The data we track, is incredible. This is about soldier, leader, knowing each other, the sense of the, this, is, this idea of a golden triangle. And I think it goes back to General Carrillo's point earlier, though, that, that we need to become much more data literate so we can understand, A, what the data is telling us and then how we interrogate it to get ahead of any potential problems that might materialize when it comes to individual readiness, rather than have to deal with the consequences after the fact. Any other comments or questions from the floor? Good afternoon, uh, Mark Quantock, retired Army guy, um, current, currently in industry. A question for uh, General Rainey. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how the Army is integrating some of the technology that was discussed into major war fighting exercises. 18 Corps, I think, is doing a great job with some of the stuff that, that they're doing. But the exercises that the Army writ large is running, is, is TRADOC keeping up with integrating AI, ML, uh, open source intelligence, big data, again, in major exercises? Thanks a lot. Great to see you again, sir. Um, Yeah, I, I think that we're learning a lot about that. So I think there's a universal recognition that we need to be, starting with General McConville, General Murray um, out at AFC. So there's been in the past, there's kind of been this uh, no pen line between exercising and experimenting. I think you're, you're familiar with that. So we had a culture of uh, for a lot of good reasons. So you go to NTC and you, you, fight, you fight with what you got. If you can't maintain your kit and you don't have, you got an eight-man rifle squad, then, then you fight the way you're going to fight. And there's a lot of goodness in that because, like you know, and a lot of the combat veterans know, you fight, you know, you go to combat, you fight with what you fight. Um, and at MCTP and some of our, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, some of our division and core high-end premier uh, training exercises, we've in the past resisted giving the core division commander something that they don't have. Um, at the same time, we spend a lot of time, money, and energy on experimenting, both in TRADOC and since AFC stood up, they've kind of leaned into that as the lead for the Army. Uh, one of the things General Murray and his team have found is these the most effective part of experimenting is getting it in the hands of soldiers. Something we're doing fundamentally different now as we modernize is the realization that getting a rifle, rifle platoon to wear it, getting 19 series tankers on the, on the, in the decision making, not decision making, but providing feedback to people that are making decisions about uh, the next kind of combat vehicle. So because of those things, over the last 12 to 18 months, we've started overlapping them. So if they were overlapping circles, I'd say they're overlapping at about 20% of the surface area right now. General Carrilla fought his warfighter with some emerging technology, did great. It skewed the exercise, so magically the CSR on the, on the I can't say which, what it was, but <laughs> the CSR dried up. So we're good enough to blend the two. 
Project Convergence is a premier experiment that we're doing as an Army now, and, and, and there are soldiers uh, that are involved in that and are getting training value out of that. But not, not to the extent we need to be yet, but we are, yes. But, but I would tell you, so that I think TRADEX done a great job of listening. So like we used a thing called broad area surveillance targeting, which is artificial intelligence uh, machine learning, and we're able to incorporate that. It's the capability we have now. And we did that for our, our warfighter. And then we also looked at the way we're doing the joint targeting toolbox, which is what all the combatant commands use for their targeting process. And uh, when Jim was out at CAC, we were able to say, hey, this, this, is, this is how we're going to fight to go away from the 50-year-old 1972 product that literally the name of the form is the, the 1972 because that's when it came about um, to be able to go to a, a new but it took a lot of work on the back end of TRADOC to create a, a um, simulation that had all of this database in there and so each one every warfighter gets better and better at being able to do that and we did some they experimented with some unique capabilities that we were able to have for for one portion of the fight and then uh um, for the next Global Defender exercise, it's a warfighter exercise uh, that the Corps will be the uh, um, training audience for our 3rd Infantry Division, which will be a response, but they're going to actually be one of the new Army Penetration Divisions with some modern capability to include future vertical lift for that specific portion um, of the warfighter. Can, can I just make a point on yeah, uh, from an allies and partners, uh, partners perspective? I think. Um, uh, technology uh, is a potential risk as much as it, as it is uh, an opportunity. There is a risk, of course, out there that some of your allies and partners uh, can't keep up with the pace of technological evolution and adaptation um, in the context of war fighting and competition in the future. I only, I only say that because it's something that we need to be alive to uh, as uh, technology inevitably gains momentum uh, over time. Uh, but I also think that there's an opportunity because some of your allies and partners are very technologically adapt, um, and adept rather, uh, and they can turn issues, and I think Warfighter with, with the French and the UK and many other nations that have participated is a great venue for some of those small nations to bring some of their technological solutions to contemporary military problems to the fore as well, um, and we can share ideas. I just thought there were two issues that were worth uh, highlighting in the context of uh, interoperable technological development. While we're waiting for the next question, I'd like to ask General Carrillo, you've talked a lot about uh, AI and machine learning and, uh, and being an AI-enabled core. What metrics are you using to determine the effectiveness of using AI uh, in, so in your core? One of the things we do every, every one of these Scarlet Dragon exercises is we take a piece of terrain, so we'll take uh, whether it's imagery, um, and so this last one we did 50 square kilometers of imagery and we put just human analysts against it, the same number of human analysts, and it took them X amount of time. Um, in that time, they were 85% accurate. Then we did standalone artificial intelligence, and I'll talk about algorithms in a minute, and they were nine times faster, but only 60% accurate. Then we said, let's take humans, those same analysts or different analysts for this one, and then give them augmentation of AI, and what we found is that it was 6.5 times faster, but 95% accurate. And that was in the ability to identify targets in that 50 square kilometer box, which would be typical of a, a core deep fight um, out there. And as you know anything about algorithms, it's, you know, it's about the data set. Uh, the head of Chinese uh, um, artificial intelligence, one of their largest uh, companies over there, said if he had a million dollars, he would spend $990,000 of it on labeling and $10,000 on algorithms. So we have an effort that we're doing both in the core and partner with USDI, and we're actually doing it with our Fayetteville Tech Community College on doing unclassified labeling, and then we also have elements that we're doing on our classified labeling side um, going forward. So the key is we want to get to this data labeling. And then every quarter when we do our, we get new algorithm sets, we currently right now have um, six to eight algorithm companies that come in and then we're able to put them against these, these commercial vendors, whether that's Microsoft, Clarify, Amazon, et cetera. And if they aren't meeting the standard, then we can cut them away. And what we're able to do is take a standard set, whether it's real world or uh, um, from a real world exercise or, uh, or different imagery, and we can run that through and we can see how much did the algorithms improve over the last time. And we're seeing significant gains in some and, and some not so much. And one of the key things we find is when we sit down with the vendors, with actual operators and, um, 
and our Intel analysts, and they say, this is what I'm looking for, that we've seen significant gains in our algorithms. We use that as a metric to say, are we making the right progress going forward? Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm not looking to take you off the hook from your opportunity to ask questions, so I do encourage you to do so. <laughs> Great, General, thank you. All right, sir. All right, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Um, Jeff Holmes, Adjutant General, Tennessee. So my question is about the, the total force and one of the benefits of the past um, two decades operating in two theaters is we've built a total force, all three components side by side, serving with the fully integrated, not seen, seen since World War II. Um, the, the, the fear I have that we're gonna go back to our stovepipes and we're gonna operate within our stovepipes. Uh, there was the total force policy when it came out, it uh, instituted uh, associated unit pilot program, some alignments amongst units, things of that nature. Will there be any focus to maintain the synergy that we've developed over the past two decades and not lose that? Over. Yeah, Jeff, I, thanks. That's a great question. Um, just being around the chief, the secretary, General Jensen, uh, working with, with Compo 2 and 3, General Garrett, I'll defer to him, but uh, I, I've not heard anybody that's not adamant about maintaining that working relationship. Interdependence, I would say, is even more accurate than interoperability. Um, and as you well know, you know, Optempo is going down in Compo 1, and it hasn't had a commensurate drop in Compo 2. So the, the things that Compo 2 and 3 do uh, for our citizens in the homeland, coupled with the rotational missions that are allocated to Compo 2 and 3 and the interoperability. General Clark's here, I, our great RSEN commander, I, I, I think he would tell you that that, uh, that you look around his area of responsibility in theater, you'll see soldiers from every Compo. I know that's the way it is in uh, and Kevin Marcus is here, so if you if you ask somebody over in USARAF, they'd see that, and I don't I don't think that's going to change. What we do owe the combo two and three, I think, is is that predictability I was talking about. Um, you know, we we uh, and it's on me. So we plan stuff, and then we act like mobilizing combo two and three is a surprise, and that causes us two problems: one, money, because it's a UFER. But more importantly, it's disruptive to the great soldiers and families that serve in the National Guard and Reserve. So if we know that we're going to be doing something with Compo 2 and 3, the challenge the chief has given me is let's, let's get it into rearm, let's get it synced up, let's build some mission lines, let's palm for it, let's create the predictability so when a, one, of our, one, of our, one of your units hits their ready year, that we got something for them to do, and they knew that a couple years ago so that they could generate the readiness required for it. So I yes, hope that answers yes, your sir. question. Yes, it, sir, it, it does, and, and that, uh, yeah, the predictability, you know, our soldiers in, in this, I've been in 42 years, I've seen the National Guard since 1979. Unbelievable, the formations that we have in both component two and, and three, but those soldiers, our soldiers want to be engaged it's obviously finding the right op-tempo, purse tempo that they can sustain. I think being an ABCT state, I think the one in five is sustainable. I truly do. Uh, I think there's opportunities, Defender, you know, the Defender exercise, even if we may not have a mission line, is to get my soldiers downrange. It doesn't have to be for 12 months. It can be for 30 days. Uh, we've got those 15, 21 day statutory AT days. They need that. They need that to drive their readiness. They need that to drive their focus. And without that, they're going to go do something else. Yep, absolutely. The other thing I'll tell you is the Chief's absolutely committed when you look at any modernization effort that it's spread Compo 1, Compo 2, and Compo 3, which will, which will, that would be really bad if we, if we got a, uh, if we got airspace between or white space between our modernization efforts across the compos because that would prohibit that kind of interoperability you're talking about and I, I know the chief's not going to let that happen either thanks sir thank you um, in, in an earlier comment dr preble raised the issue of the whether or not the war is going to be over here or over there um, it raises the question of the uh, vulnerability and security of the homeland I'm going to first ask General Keating and then to others in the panel, what are the implications of that, the vulnerability of the homeland, as we look to um, 
generating readiness so that we can mobilize and project forces from CONUS over time. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I, think, I think the Secretary, um, it was great to hear the Secretary uh, bring this up uh, in her opening comments this morning. <coughs> Uh, the risk of an assumption that, uh, you know, the homeland is a safe and secure place from which to uh, launch operations in, into the future. And certainly from a three-core perspective, the foundation of which is heavy armoured capability, I, I think there's two things that I'd, I'd observe. First of all, the inherent threat to the integrity of our supply chain. And, and, and as I said in my comments, uh, three-core goes where our vehicles go. And, and if we have any risk to the sustainability of our supply chain, uh, then of course it's self-evident um, that we would only be able to go uh, to the limit of our resources. I think the second thing, though, from a, from a three-core perspective, uh, is ensuring um, the ability and the modernization of our mobilization and force generation installations as well. These are critical launch pads to ensuring that three-core uh, responds at the, at the speed of relevance for an armored core. Um, and that is a huge burden, that is a huge resource demand, but nonetheless it's necessary to make sure that we've got that launch pad uh, from which to, to reach forward um, in a competitive and unpredictable world. Anybody else? So one of, one of the concerns we have is the ability to obtain any type of surprise um, as, we, as we blow out. So the same stuff we were talking about, can we pick up all these different uh, targets? We are watched 24-7 on all of our installations. Um, and so the ability to, to not be noticed, and if you ever go out there and see flight radar, every single flight that went in and out of Kabul was almost near real time. You could watch it from where it took off, whether it was CONUS or over in uh, Europe, as it went into Kabul and then took back out. Um, you could literally watch it in real time. And that, that is one of the ubiquitousness of that ability to do that. And the same thing for all of our airfields. Um, Right before I took command, they did an exercise at Fort Bragg, a no notice, and it did not, it caused a little bit of drama. Um, they did a, a, a no notice, uh, there was an EDRI going on, emergency deployment readiness exercise. Well, they cut all the power to Fort Bragg, and we're only going on emergency backup power with the exception of the hospital. Um, and of course, that uh, no one really knew about that, so that caused quite a bit. I made a lot of good social media um, out of that. I think it cost two goldfish. Um, but, but what came out of that was some of the, re the areas we identify from a resiliency standpoint in terms of both our, our power capability, but you can take that across the board. What happens when we have a DISA outage on our email? Let me watch what happens to the, uh, um, on, we actually get more productive. Um, the, uh, but what, what happens when these type of things happen in our communication system? That's where I think we have great vulnerability. Uh, this last uh, um, no notice deployment to Kabul uh, Pope Air Force or Pope Airfield was closed. It's in the process of being uh, resurfaced. It opens back up here in a couple of days, but for four months. And so we had to go out of uh, Joint Base Charleston, which is six hours away. Um, but the way we did that is by rehearsing, 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 like Herb Brooks and Miracle. It's going over and over again to make sure you can meet that. Um, so I think these are the things that we have to do to make sure um, that we're able to do that. Anybody else? I mean, let me just say that as a resilience and redundancy is, is a core to, to effectiveness, right? It's not, it's not unique to the Army. And, I, and again, I think some of the really creative work being done in national security policy right now is really emphasizing that, re emphasizing the ability of our, of our society, of all the components that are responsible for national security to be able to to adapt quickly, right? And again, all credit to the Army, part of this is made possible by realistic, rigorous training, right? Um, the rest of our country doesn't have that luxury. So here's an opportunity for the, for the Army, it seems, to help, right? Is to convince the rest of the country about the importance of resilience and, and actually demonstrating, that's a, that's a wonderful example, General Corilla, um, demonstrating that a little bit of preparation can go a long way in a crisis. Um, I, and again, there are some other components that, are, that do this sort of training, um, but it just doesn't touch nearly enough people in this country right now. And I think, I think we should think creatively about ways to, to generate realistic scenarios that involve a much wider range of people. 
think just go back and look at the Colonial Pipeline and, right. and what that happened. Right. We lost, right. it, and right. it took us about, right. I think it was about two weeks into it before we lost all fuel right. on, uh, on, on Fort Bragg right. and then the time it took. But that was just one small example um, that Im impacted us as well. Not our, not our military supply, but our commercial supply. Sir, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, Please. My name, uh, my name is Cadet John Williams. Uh, I'm a, a ROTC cadet from the Hoya Battalion at Georgetown University. Um, and I just had a quick question for the panel. I'd like to thank you all for coming to speak with us. Um, Nicholas Chayan, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, uh, the first uh, chief, uh, chief uh, technology. and other emerging technologies? I would tell you I have an entire chain of command that starts with the Secretary of Defense and goes all the way down that supports everything that we're doing. Um, we're, not a fail, we're not afraid to fail on some of the things that we're experimenting with. I think if you see with the DepSec def, this is a huge effort for, for her as well. Our Secretary Wormuth, um, she's been down and seen, them, so we feel empowered. I mean, the biggest thing is you have to embrace it as a, as a, uh, a culture, and that takes years to be able to do but again, I think it has to go back to the PME question. We have to get it into our PME because if you don't, people are afraid of it um, and they don't understand it. But is they, if they start to understand and they see the importance of why things should be in a cloud environment and a structured environment so that you can run algorithms off it, uh, the warfighter we just ran, normally what happens after a warfighter, all that data, it gets rewritten. It gets literally, they rewrite the hard drives and it's all left on the cutting room floor. We're able to take all that data, structure it, put it in a cloud environment, and then run, as new algorithms come out, we run all kinds of different information to see what do we learn about that. It could be anywhere from sustainment to, uh, to how we did our fires. And so I think, I, I don't think we, we could lose. I don't think we will lose in terms of that, but it's a matter of embracing it. And you know, in my little piece of the pie down here, we're doing everything we can um, to be able to do that. But I feel completely empowered um, by the chain of command to continue to push that. But great question, and, and uh, have you decided what branch you're going yet? <laughs> uh, unfortunately not cyber, uh, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Anybody else want to talk about that? Nope. <clears throat> okay, from the audience. <clears throat> so as Jim Walker, I'm the British Liaison Officer at the Command Arms Center. Um, General Rennie spoke about the um, the uh, readiness contradiction. General Garrett has invited us to, to sweat more. I applaud the US Army's uh, singular focus on the ability to, to fight and win, but my question is, do you have any insights into how we develop leaders who can do the same in competition, who can compete and win? Or is that just a false premise, and actually the Army should lead all, leave all of that to the other levers of national power? Take that one. Okay, we'll start with the stray vault, but then we'll look to the yeah, panel start, to be start. thinking through how, <laughs> yeah, they, that, how that, they want to respond to that's that. That's exactly what I was going to say. Don't the rest of them are not off the hook just because I'm going to be the stray <laughs> vault first. Um, to your question, I think that these sort of thinking about and perfecting the other instruments of statecraft beyond the use of force and coercion is a perennial problem. Right? This is not this is not new. Right? Um, sometimes in a democratic society, you get lucky and you get some really, really exceptionally capable people where the combination of the ability to get elected also, can, also means that they're great strategists. Um, but those, those are rare, right? Um, the theory is, and I'm just talking out loud here, thinking out loud. Um, 
The theory is that the benefit, the strength of a democracy is that you're not relying just on that one leader, but for the, the, of, of the rest of the society. And, and the rest of the society is given an opportunity to express their expertise, right? This is the theory of sort of democratic superiority, which is plausible, it seems to me. Um, but are we, an, are we providing enough opportunities for civilians to exercise those kind of leadership skills um, and the kinds of leadership skills that are, that are especially <laughs> relevant to national security. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Now again, I've sort of concealed a little bit of this. Um, I benefited enormously as a young um, uh, junior officer from what I learned in the Navy commissioning out of, out of a, a civil university, George Washington University, ROTC, Navy ROTC. Um, and to this day, the things that I learned even in leadership class as a senior, as a first class midshipman, um, are absolutely relevant to my success in my day-to-day -day life. So here again, convincing people that there are benefits to doing this kind of rigorous training and being exposed to it um, is, a, is the first step. Um, and I think one of the challenges we've seen is the separation of the military from the society that it serves. And one of the dangers is precisely that you don't have that kind of, kind of cross-pollination. So I actually wanted to come back to this anyway. Um, I think that the importance of PME has to leverage the outstanding civilian universities and colleges in this country and beyond, which General Carrillo also mentioned. Again, this partnership with the, with the universities in North Carolina, which sounds fascinating to me. Um, again, we need to produce, create more opportunities like that. And we need to highlight them when we do. We need to publicize them. We need to make people aware of them. Um, so back to your original question. I think there are opportunities to develop those kind of leadership skills and the sort of strategic thinking, but it's not going to happen by accident. It has to be deliberate. And here again, the Army can help by demonstrating how it has, it has you know, succeeded, um, but it needs a lot of, you know, it needs a lot of others um, in the national security establishment to, to come along, to, you know, to, to amplify that message. Now I really want to hear from the rest of the panel because I'm just, you know. Well, I I think a leader who thought about large-scale combat ops going forward and said to him or herself, well, I'm glad we're going back to fighting because I don't need to worry about thinking anymore. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be on that team or on that person's <laughs> flank, right? So uh, being a little facetious, but, but I, I think, you know, shame on us if we don't take everything we've learned about uh, the last 20 years that all of our countries have paid for, you know, treasure and, and way more importantly, blood and sacrifice, right? So I think the future is going to be all that. I think you're going to have to be able to synchronize war fighting functions and, 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 and bring, converge direct and indirect fire and close the last 500 meters and, if necessary, you know, impose our will on people at an intimate distance. Uh, with our hands or bayonets if we have to. But at the same time, everything we've learned about <clears throat> the importance of the interagency, the importance of culture, red teaming, challenging your assumptions the way you think, that people don't think the way we think, the guarding, jealously guarding against ignorance and arrogance as you fight, um, that would be a big mistake. So I, I, I think you absolutely have to do both. And I, you know, I'm, I'm confident that the young men and women we have coming up that are going to be leading those formations can do that. But it would it would be bad if we started thinking that it's easier now. You know, and I, I've heard. I'll be honest. I'm, I mean, I've just little minor indications of okay. You know, now we can just focus on movement to contacts, right? Um, I, I think the next fight. I I think your rear area is going to look like the worst day you had in Baghdad, <laughs> 05, 06, 07. It's good. There's going to be parts of your your area of operation that look like the Argon, you know, some some indige forces somewhere, and you got some SF teammates that are out there.
trying to flip them onto our side versus the other. I mean, all that stuff's going to be happening at a, at a speed and pace and a level of violence that, that you know, we'll have trouble wrapping our heads around. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, you've had an opportunity to ask a question. I don't feel compelled to drag this out to 1630 just because that's what the time said. I'm going to ask one final, I'm going to ask one final question of the panel to pull on something that was mentioned earlier, and then uh, we'll give them an opportunity to close with closing questions, or closing statements. Um, earlier, uh, Major General Keating made a comment about people and the role that they play in, it, in balancing that with readiness in, in uh, uh, three core. I've heard General Rainey talk about that before. I'd just like to ask the question on your behalf. The Army says people first, but we're talking about readiness. How do you balance people first and achieving readiness? And I know that we're also implementing rearm so that we can add modernization in there. How do we balance people first and readiness? And I'm going to uh, ask General Rainey to take it first. Okay, um, great question, get that a lot. Um, our, our, our chief of staff of the Army has, has told leaders to build cohesive teams that are well-trained, disciplined, and fit that can fight and win. That's, that's people first, right? They're not, I, I, would, I would go to the map with anybody that thought those were two different things, taking care of people, and generate more winning readiness are inextricably linked, inseparable. Um, you can't have a cohesive team if you don't take care of your soldiers and you can't take care of your families. And uh, the things we ask our men and women to do in combat, you know, they follow orders in garrison because of UCMJ. They, they run out into the open and put themselves between a wounded teammate and the enemy because they believe that their leaders and their teammates care about them. So I don't, I don't, I, I really wrestle with trying to think of them as, as, uh, as, as anything other than two parts of a, a whole that are inextricably linked. You know, I was taught early, early in my career and have believed it since the single best thing you can do for a soldier is make sure they're well led. And the best thing you can do for a unit is make sure that if they go to war, that they're going to win and they're going to come home with honor. So to me, it, it's crystal clear that you absolutely have to do both or you're going to fail your soldiers in garrison and you're going to fail your country on the battlefield. And I don't, I don't think anybody, anybody wants to do that. Great. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? John no, I think you nailed it. I mean, the, uh, I think too many, too, there are some people that believe it is a, uh, is it a binary. You can't have people first and still have highly trained units. But I'll tell you, we actually, we did a survey and, and that, that what came out of that is, I mean, there's like 80 some, 85% say that you can have people first and still be incredibly uh, high readiness uh, in your formations. And, and Jim nailed it though about being well led. I think that is one of the, the most important things and that's why a leader development is one of the most important things we do. All right, thanks. Anybody else on that subject? Uh, 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 just at risk of repeating uh, what's just been said, you know, it, it's not binary, they're, they're, they're part of the same continuum. Uh, you know, competing and winning is a human endeavor and it begins with people um, and it ends with people, so. Okay, I would uh, like to thank our panel. Uh, before I close, I'm gonna give them an opportunity to make some closing comments. We'll start down at the end with Dr. Preble and come back this way. Great, thanks, Dick, and thanks again to all of you for attending and again for the invitation to speak. I mean, I, I've i thrown out some pretty, I, I hope, some challenging thoughts, perspectives from someone from outside of the organization, and I hope you found it to be valuable. And the one thing I'll just leave you with is, is sort of how, how I started is, and we've heard uh, over the course of the last 90 minutes about the importance of, especially now, trying to be adaptable and thoughtful and checking one's assumptions and, and testing those assumptions. Um, and it's a, it's a practice, it's a skill like anything else. Um, if you train yourselves to do it, you will be better leaders and you will be a more effective organization. Um, and so if I can leave you with just one thought, um, challenge those assumptions, lean into it. Thanks.
Thank you, sir. General Keating. Yeah, my, my thanks uh, for allowing me to be part of such a great panel, and thanks for the great questions that are out there as well. Um, you know, there are elements of three corps readiness challenge that are unique given the nature of our organization. We're, we're an armored corps, and come the time that we commit three corps to the fight, then nationally, we, the U.S., is in a very, very significant point of, uh, of decision making. Uh, for us, though, as I said, it's about people and it's about our maintenance and supply culture as much as it is uh, anything else. Uh, but I'd also say that nobody fights alone. Um, and I know there are a number of allies and partners in this room. Uh, and I'm sure I can speak on behalf of you all to say what a privilege it is uh, to be associated with the US Army and AUSA as well. Thanks for having somebody up here, an alien up here uh, on the board. Um, and uh, it's great to be a part of this journey with you. Thank you. Hey, hey, thanks, everybody. I'm passionate about the Army, so happy to follow up with, uh, with anybody afterwards. I'd like to thank you all for, for your time and attention. I believe one of the most respectful things you can do for somebody is give them some of your time, and, and I appreciate that. It's not something I take lightly. I hope it was worth it. And thanks uh, to all of you, especially the Soldier for Life, some of the great veterans out there. You know, we're all up here on the backs of people that showed us how to do it, and most of us are closer to being done than getting started. And I'm, I'm real, personally real confident with the young men and women they are going to lead the next, uh, next couple decades of the Army. God bless you. Okay, thanks. I would like to thank General Garrett and this uh, terrific panel for their thoughtful comments and remarks and for their answers to your questions. I'd like to thank each of you for your attendance and for the thoughtful questions that you posed to the panel and for your interest in this very important topic of how do we revisit the readiness balance. So thank you for your attendance. And I thank AUSA for hosting this forum and giving us the opportunity to talk about this very important topic. I'm also mindful that in forums like these that the we are to be reminded that the most critical capabilities that our Army has to offer are our soldiers and our civilians who deliver that readiness each and every day. And it's to those soldiers and those civilians for whom we remain indebted completely. So uh, with them in our mind, uh, I thank you for your attendance and I wish you all a great rest of AUSA. Thank you. you are.